Well, there'll be some of you that'll be watching this that you'll know that this is a, a retake. Or we had some technical difficulties this past Sunday morning, but yet this was a lesson that we felt like needed to be recorded and needed to be online. So we are going to, um, we're going to engage in that, and we hope that you're blessed by it very, very much. So um, the, the title of the lesson, as you can see, is The, the Love of His Life. My contention is, is that what has happened in our, in our lives and our fellowship and our culture is that we've gotten further and further and further away from the proper appreciation of the church. And so for the next five weeks um, here at Hardin Valley, we're going to look at the book of Ephesians, and we're going to look at the imagery that Paul uses, the word pictures that God gives us through Paul in his writings, about the church and we're going to try to learn lessons from it and so if you look at the title you understand that we we talk about people he's he's um he's engaged and everything that he thinks about is his bride-to-be um they are they're newlyweds or even better they've been married for 30 years and still the pep in his step still the thing that drives him is the queen of his house the one that he loves she is the love of his life I entitled it that because when we study the the imagery the picture that we get today Paul is talking about Jesus being being a bridegroom and he talks about the love of his life well it was June the 10th 1977 it was in Daytona Beach, Florida, at the Bevel Road Church of Christ, Gentry Stoltz was standing behind me. My dad was standing beside me as my best man. My brother was there in the wedding. All of my best friends um, were up front as my groomsmen. And all of a sudden, the doors in the rear of the auditorium swung open. Oh, the girls had already come in. But there's that time when... Linda's mom stood up and the doors swung open and there she stands. I mean, all the air left the room. It was the most beautiful creature I had ever seen. And as she walked down that aisle, my mind was spinning with joy, with with hope, with dreams, with responsibility, with all kinds of questions and all kinds of promises. It was amazing. And I wish somebody had told us, you know, we, we went, before we got married, and this is the truth, this isn't a preacher story, we had been engaged, um, we had been dating for a year and a half, we had really had known each other, we'd spent a lot of time together, we felt like, you know, we got this because we had never had a crossword, we had never had a fuss. And so there's certain people that might need counseling. There's certain people that might need a mentor couple or whatever. But how can you get better than never having a crossword, never having a fuss at all? And so as we got married, we thought, this is easy street right here, man. This is going to be a life just filled with nothing but party, party, party. It's going to be great. (laughs) I wish somebody, I had heard it, but I wish somebody could have impressed on me a couple of things number one that this was really going to be hard work because everybody that has a good relationship even good friendships but everybody that has a good marriage a strong marriage I'm not talking about they just live in the same house together but they have a relationship that blesses I mean they have a a good relationship they've worked they have put in work and I wish somebody could have helped me to understand Larry for what you want for what you dream of, I want you to understand this is going to take some really hard work. And secondly, that they could have helped me to understand that it's really, really worth it. And it is. It is really, really worth it. I mean, Linda and I have this relationship now where we can communicate. Oh, we don't communicate perfectly. I don't want to lead you down that road and think that it's like it was when I got married. Hey, we never have a fuss. We never have a crossword. It's not that. We have tools on our belt. We know we can make it through anything. We have a commitment that is, that is until death do us part, 
and we love each other, we serve each other, we know how to handle conflict in our lives. And God has blessed us with this great relationship with each other, with five wonderful children and five wonderful um, daughters and sons-in-law and 13 fantastic grandkids. It's worth it. So, But there's another picture I want you to look at. Uh, another picture of a snapshot of a bride and groom. But this time the groom is way different. It's not Larry Klein. He's not in a tan tux. It's not, it, it, the bridegroom here is Jesus. And as we read, I want you to really kind of pick up who the lucky girl is because God wants us to understand who it is. So let's read together out of Ephesians 5. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. I want you to note, okay, I've already passed by some of them, but I want you to note all the things it says that Jesus does for the church. We'll let the cat out of the bag because you already know, for his bride. He's going to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife, why he loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for, her, for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. So, uh, did you see that? I mean, did you see that? I've used this text with people that were in the auditorium Sunday morning. Um, I've done premarital counseling with quite a few of those couples, and I've always turned to Ephesians 5, and I've always talked about husbands and wives, but did you catch it? Did you see what Paul said? He says, this is a profound mystery. I'm not talking about husbands and wives. I'm not talking about what a husband ought to be and what a wife ought to be. I'm talking about Christ and the church, he says. I'm talking about Christ and the church. So Paul says that Jesus has a bride, and that that bride is us. That bride is the church, that we are married to Jesus. The book of Ephesians talks about the church more than any other book that I know of. And so this first image, this first picture that we pull out is one of the dominant ones that Paul uses, and, and, and one of the more, I mean, poignant. It just, what? I mean, God loves me enough to invite me to be his bride? And, and so our challenge, our challenge is to love the bride. Because let's be honest, it's a whole lot easier to love Jesus than it is to love the church. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is consistent. In fact, Scripture even goes so far in Hebrews chapter 13, it will say that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I mean, Jesus is always the same. We aren't. The church isn't. The church can be moody, people in the church. Uh, it, living in the church, living with the bride of Christ, is a lot like getting married. When you got married, you went on your honeymoon and everything was fantastic and everything was wonderful and it was easy. The wedding was a blast and everybody was positive and things went great by and large at the wedding and it was fantastic. And then you found out that a, a marriage is a lot more difficult than a wedding. And when you come into the church to begin with, you go, you get to this point where you understand that you are a sinner, that you're condemned. Oh, but I've got a Savior. I've got a bridegroom that wants this relationship with me. And he actually died on the cross for me so that I could have that kind of relationship with him. And I come to him and all of my sins are forgiven. And I'm whiter than snow. And I lay my head on my 
bed on my pillow at the end of the day, and, and man, just not one sin to my charge. I got this. Jesus, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to say, I will be yours. I mean, this is going to be, we've never had a crossword. We've never had a fuss. This is just going to be party, party. It's going to be easy street. And then all of a sudden, the war with the flesh comes. And I, and I start realizing that everybody in the church that I've, I've looked up to, that I thought, man, they're all just awesome. I start realizing they all have clay feet. They all have a carnal nature. They all have bad breath in the morning when they wake up. And it gets to be difficult. And so, at times it can be hard to love the church. I mean, you think about it even. A lot of us have been hurt by the church, haven't we? I got people to raise their hands Sunday. If you've ever been hurt by the church, raise your hand. And no, it wasn't just a few. Because people hurt people. We live in a culture that's anti-institution. And the church is seen as an institution, especially in, in culture. And so people want to tear it down. They don't want anything to do with it. We live in a culture where it's cool to complain. In fact, it's seen as intellectual to be skeptical and to complain and to find fault. And so people are constantly tearing down the bride of Christ. And most of us, really, uh, we're just very, very busy. Very, very busy. And one of the easiest things to cut, of course, is the church. So it's appropriate, really appropriate for us to back up and to ask, why church? What's so great about church? Why should I have church as a priority in my life? Why should I love the bride of Christ? Um, number one, we'll just share some points here. Number one, we ought to love the bride of Christ because Jesus chose us. He chose the church. This was, the church was his idea. He started it, and he chose it. That it was his idea that he sacrificed on the cross for it, shed his blood, hung there, went through all the pain and the agony of the cross so that he could call us as his bride. So here's the challenge. If Jesus being perfect can love this flawed group of people, if Jesus being perfect can love this church, huh, then why can't we? Why can't we? Even the, the word church itself, back in the first century, it wasn't a religious term. It was the word ecclesia, and I would imagine you've probably heard that before. But it wasn't a religious word in the first century. It meant a called out assembly. So if you were to talk about the state legislature that meets in Nashville, that would be in the first century, you would say it was a church. It was a called out assembly. It was, in secular terms, it was the convening of an assembly for important business. And so they're called out of the general populace to meet, to pass laws for the good of the state, for the good of the people. And so they would have been called a, a church. So the church, we love the church. When we talk about it now, we have one definition, and it's just it's, we go to church, we meet with this body of believers. But really, when we look at it, we ought to be saying that we're called out of the world to convene and assemble for the business of Jesus Christ, for the business of Jesus. So did you hear that? The church, a called out group to accomplish important business, a called out group then out of the world to convene and to carry out the business of Jesus. So it's not your business. It's not my business. It's not about you. It's not about me, but it's about Jesus and carrying out his will. That's what the church is about. And it's always interesting to me that when folks get down on the church, the first thing that they want to cut is the ecclesia, the assembly. The assembly. And maybe that makes sense when you think about it. How, how did we get to this point where it's so easy for people to discount the church, not to have it as a priority? I'm old enough that I think I get it. I think I understand. So think with me here for a little bit. Because years ago, here's what we said, that if you're going to be faithful in the church, that you need to 
make sure that every time you meet together, you go through the five acts of worship. You know, and, and we memorized what those were, and we were, we were going to make sure that we preached the Word, and we were going to make sure that we partook of the Lord's Supper, and that we gave, and that we prayed, and, 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 so, and, and that we sang. We were going to go through those five acts of worship. And then Hebrews 10.25 was big. And I'm not saying you don't, go, you don't worship. You worship, and you worship in spirit and in truth. I'm not discounting that. But what I'm saying is, in order to be faithful, you went through the five acts of worship, and you were there every time the door was open. Hebrews 10.25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And if you did those two things, you were faithful. No matter how you lived during the week was what wasn't expressed, but what was lived out. And so people weren't honest with their fellow man. They didn't have a good reputation in the community. They didn't really spend time in the Word. They weren't really prayer warriors. Maybe there wasn't a lot of service going on in their life. And so things had to change. They needed to change. And, and so when I was in campus ministry, for instance, people would say, um, they would say, well, i got to go to church. And anybody in the campus ministry back then would go, no, 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 you don't go to church. You don't go to church. You are the church. So go be the church. Go be Jesus. To be, and that's not wrong either. That's right. You, we are the church, and we need to be the church. We need to be Jesus wherever we go, no doubt about it. But it's not one or the other at all. Um, we are the church, and, but we've got to be the church. Realize that even part of the definition of the church is to gather because it's gotten to the point where our younger generation doesn't see an importance in gathering. Give me Jesus, but not the church. I don't need to be a part of the church. You can't be a part of Jesus without being a part of his bride. Biblically, you can't have one without the other. You got to go to church, and you got to be the church. Secondly, not only does, did Jesus choose us, Jesus teaches us. Paul says, You want to know how, how to have a good marriage? You want to know how to have a good marriage? Look at the relationship of the church to Jesus. Look at the way the church interacts with one another and interacts with Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if you could say to people today, young young marriages, hey, hey, I know you had not got any good um, examples around you, maybe, the, your, your parents might not have had great marriages, but just come to Hardin Valley. Just come and, and, and live with this church for a little bit and watch the way people treat each other, and you'll know exactly how you ought to live as husband and wife. It's what Paul says. It's what God says. You want to know how, how to have a good marriage? Watch Jesus and his church. Watch the way the church reacts to Jesus. And, and interacts with one another. The most important word in this passage out of John chapter, I mean, out of, out of, um, out of Ephesians chapter 5 is, is love. And you've heard the words for love out of the Greek before. The Greek is a lot more specific in their vocabulary in most instances than English is. <clears throat> we talk about loving things, and we don't even know what people mean emotionally when they say it. But when you talked in the Greek, you knew. Storge was family love, of course. You talked about that friend that you would die for. It was phileo love, city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. When you talked about sexual love, and it's not even, that word's not even used in the Bible, eros, but if you talked about sexual love, you used eros, where we get our word erotic. But the main word that was used in Scripture, the one that Jesus used over and over and over again, was agape, and it's what Paul uses here. It is an unconditional love. And so the good news for weddings, whenever I get to do wedding ceremonies, I'm able to tell them the great news for you is that you can love each other even on the days when you don't like each other. Yeah, because it had, agape doesn't have anything to do with emotion. It doesn't have anything to do with the way you've treated me. In fact, Jesus says, agape, your enemies. Don't return evil for evil, but return good for evil. You make a decision that you're going to always do the loving thing. And so in this relationship with the bride, the only way that we make it is with agape love. So great news for weddings. You can love each other, but not just great news for weddings, great news for the church. 
great news for the church. You can love the church even when you don't like what's happened in the church. When somebody has hurt your feelings, when somebody hasn't acted like they should, when somebody wasn't, wasn't Jesus to you, you can still love them. But it's, it's great news for um, weddings, it's great news for the church, but it's also just great news for life. As we go out into the world, we're able to act like Jesus because that's exactly the way he lived. He loved people even when they weren't really very likable. Hmm. That's John, that's Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 as a matter of fact. Remember what that says? That God commended his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, wasn't much to like about us as far as God was concerned, but while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly he demonstrated his agape for us in this while we were unlikable he loved us huh. there you go so that's how marriages make it that's how churches make it that's how you're going to be successful in being the bride of christ so look at the list that we read through i, t- I tried to i was a little late getting you to kind of hone in on it as we we're reading through scripture but look at the list of what jesus does for his bride It says, Paul says, he loves her, he gives himself up for her, he makes her better, he washes her with the word, and he feeds and cares for her. Isn't that incredible? I mean, let's just talk about a a few of those. He he loves her, and we talked about he agapes her. He gives himself up for her. He gave himself up on the cross, and he is absolutely committed to daily, to daily, transforming he makes her better his spirit lives within us and he is transforming us and making us better and stronger and more like him every day he and this is i love this one he washes her with the word in the same way that water gets dirt off the physical body the word of god gets sin out of our spirit and so he says, and that's why in this, in this body, we talk so often about being in the Word and making sure you're not going to make it. You're not going to be able to be the bride. Remember how he's going to present her without, he wants to present her without spot or wrinkle. He wants to, to have her sinless, mature. Um, and, and so you've got to be in the Word so, God, so Jesus can wash you with the Word and he feeds and he cares for you we sing songs that are all that but my jesus knows just what i need oh yes he knows just what i need he feeds me and he cares for me he is an incredible incredible god huh so when you look at jesus actions toward the bride here's the question you just looked at all the things that jesus does do you love the bride like that are you are those your actions Do you try to build up the bride of Christ like that? Jesus gave us the biblical model. That's the way we're supposed to interact when we come here. Remember Hebrews 10, 25? Yeah, yeah. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But if you go back to 24, he writes and he says, when you come together, look at how you can spur one another on to love and good deeds. Look how you can help the church to be all that it can be. So, The biblical model Jesus has shown us, and that's what, man, did you catch it, he says? Did you see that? It's a profound mystery. I'm talking to you about Christ and the church, but the American model, our cultural model, is completely different. It is consumerism, and it eats you up spiritually. It will destroy you, and it will will cause the church to have such a, a poor witness and take away so much power from the body of Christ, from the bride of Christ. Because consumerism says, I go to church for what it does for me. And if I'm not getting, if I'm not getting moved, if it's not emotional for me, if I don't like the songs, if the youth group isn't what I want it to be for me, if the children's program isn't really going, if those elders don't, if that preacher doesn't, then I'm It's just not the way the bride of Christ ought to act at all. It's not the way that we ought to think at all. Remember Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, don't be conformed to the world, 
Don't get involved in consumerism and that kind of thinking. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I beg you, Paul writes in Romans 12, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That you serve others. I like the quote that JFK gave a long time ago. If you, even if you weren't alive when he gave it, you've heard it since then. And I want to kind of change it. I want to change it away from, I want to take out your country and I want to put in your church and ask not what your church can do for you, but what you can do for, for your church. Third point today, by loving your church, you're actually loving others. Paul assumes in verse 28 that we love ourselves, and there's nothing wrong with that. He says everybody takes care of their body. Everybody loves himself. You're supposed to love others as you love yourself. And so if you don't love yourself, you can't be effective for God. He's not talking about being proud and haughty, but he's talking about loving yourself. So by loving the church, we are loving ourselves. When you love the bride of Christ, you're blessing yourself. God, sometimes we talk about the church as if we're divorced from it. You know, what they ought to do down there, I think what the, what the, you know, that church does, we always talk, the church ought to be doing, why didn't anyone, when, wait a minute, the whole point that Paul's trying to get across is the bride of Christ is you. It's not them, but it's you. You are, are a part of the bride of Christ. All of us are the bride of Christ. And so we seek to build up not to tear down. Can I just tell you that um, one of the things that's broken my heart, and I know probably has broken yours, is that in the past year with the pandemic and everything that's gone on and going through the political season, wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree that the political process and the political culture has done great harm to our nation? That has torn our nation apart that we are not unified, that we don't know each other and love each other. We aren't working toward the same goals in so many instances. I mean, when somebody tries to do good and they're in one party, the other party, no matter, is going to try to tear it down because what they want is the supremacy of their party and their ideology. But here's what's happened, I'm afraid, is that we've let the same mindset political mindset and political practices come into the body of christ oh and i know there's convictions okay i've got convictions too uh and I, i know that there are convictions there are things that are that you hold very strongly and dearly that you think are biblical but can i just say this that there is never a time when within the body of christ or representing christ That it's okay to treat somebody else in an ugly way. Never, never is that right. We work to build up, not tear down. Political tactics are doing great harm to our nation. And if we bring the same attitudes and tactics into this church, we're in danger of doing great harm to the body of Christ. Never, ever, ever let it be so. Number four, by loving the church, we're loving God. We're loving others. By loving the church, we're loving others. I mean, in the book of Ephesians, when you read it, there's this imagery that's given that I think is so cool. The angels are looking. They're almost on their tiptoes, and they're looking to see what it is that God's doing through Jesus. What's happening with the church? And, and they applaud. I mean, they, they, they're looking, what, what is it? What is the, what is the mystery? Biblically, A mystery is something that you wouldn't know or be aware of unless God revealed it, okay? And so Ephesians talks about this mystery. What is the mystery? Now, you need to back up a little bit. You need to know some context, okay? And if you've heard it before, you need to let it sink in and how deep it went, okay? Because the Jew and the Gentile would have nothing to do with one another. They did not like each other. That's why Jesus uses, remember the story, the Good Samaritan? It was to blow up Jewish hearts. It was to make them say, what? There is nothing good about a Samaritan. Because a Samaritan, of course, was a Gentile. You're telling me 
that a priest and a Levite Jews passed by the guy that needed help, and it was a Samaritan that went to him? I mean, that just, they despised one another. And the mystery was that in Christ Jesus, the two could be made one. The barrier, the dividing wall of partition between them would be removed when Jesus died on the cross, that his blood would take away the sins of both, and that he would bring them together as one body. He would bring them together in, in his bride. He wanted to marry both of them. And so the mystery was, we can be this marvelous place where we love each other and where we don't build walls. And so in the book of Galatians, Paul goes, no, in Christ, there's no more male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, free. There is none. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And so unconditional love, barriers broken down, all on the same playing field, all saying, I do to the bridegroom who's inviting us to come and and to have this, this marriage with him. Paul believes that we can be so different that we could look like Christ's love for the church. And so the fundamental principle for all of that to happen now, Paul gives at the beginning of that discussion about husbands and wives, no, 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 about Christ and the church. And it's in chapter 5, verse 21, and he will say, you submit to one another. First, before I talk about any of this, he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There is no place, there is no place in my life where I get to see how, where I am in my relationship with Jesus Christ more than in my relationship with my wife. That's where I get to see if I'm willing to love unconditionally, if I'm willing to serve, even when I don't feel like serving, when I'm willing to do what I really don't want to do out of reverence for Christ. That's where I get to see about my maturity. So he says, we submit to Christ and we say to Jesus, you are the head of this household. That's what we as the church say. You, Jesus, are the head of this household. We will love one another. We will be your bride. We will be faithful to you. To survive and thrive, it's got to be Jesus over culture. (laughs) Amen, amen. It's got to be Jesus over culture. It's got to be Jesus over all. It's got to be Jesus over everything in my life. And Scripture has to absolutely be truth. It has to be authoritative in my life. It is Scripture. It is not what I want. It is not what I think. It is not what I suppose. It's the authority of God's Word and God's Word alone. We've got to love people through differences, but never compromise the truth as the bride of Christ. Let me just run through a few things that we just can't compromise on if we are going to be the bride of Christ. The first is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We can't compromise on that. We can't compromise on Jesus, the fact that Jesus is God's Son and that salvation is only found in Him. All life is valuable. What, what is that now? All life is valuable. Young life, old life, black life, white life, red life, it doesn't matter. I mean, productive life, unproductive life, all life is valuable and, and, and is sacred, including the unborn. Marriage has a definition. It is one man and one woman for life. God has defined what marriage is. Biblical, there's a biblical sexual ethic and that, it's, that sex is only in marriage. And the church is the absolute best place to work on race issues because of what we have in common. You say, we're racist? What do we have in common? Wait, we're the bride of Christ, right? We're the bride of Christ, and what we have in common is our Lord Jesus Christ. It's our bridegroom. And so because of what we have in common, there are no barriers. There are no walls. There are no skin colors. There is no socioeconomic divide that would separate us or that should separate us. So one last truth, it's impossible, it is impossible to love Jesus and not love his church. That is the bride of Christ. You come to my house, I invite you over, Linda and I do, and you walk in, 
and all of a sudden you start being critical of my wife? You start embarrassing her and saying disparaging things about her and cutting her down? I'm sorry. You're not going to stay in my house very long. You can't, you can't love Jesus and not love the church. That is his bride. It's impossible. When you understand that the church is his bride, you know how Jesus expects us to act toward her. Right? I mean, that's the love of his life. When you're being critical, when you're being ugly, when you're working against things, when you're causing controversy in the body of Christ, you need to be very, very careful. When you understand that the church is his bride, you know exactly how you ought to treat her. So, a question and a reminder. First, the questions. Are you willing to do the hard work? Because it's hard work. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going, to be a, you're going to be a part of his bride. You are going to say, I do. Yes, I will. And so are you willing to do the hard work? Because it's more than a wedding ceremony. It's a marriage. And then will you be willing to bear with each other and not assume the worst? Because that's what happens in the political climate. We always assume the worst. If we bring that into the church, we destroy. We've got to always think the best. And then, the, and then, and then the, the reminder that it is worth it. It is always worth it. To be a part of a fellowship that truly loves each other and serves each other and glorifies God and lives in this incredible relationship with our bridegroom, there is nothing better on the face of the earth. So that's why the first century church was so incredible. It's why people were, they had favor with God and man. And the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. People were being drawn. They were, the angels were clapping and applauding. And the world was going, we've never seen anything like that. Man, we've got to figure out how to be a part of that. We can build something here that is just like that. That is so worth it if we're willing to be the bride of Christ. Marriage is more than a promise, guys. It's a covenant. It is a covenant. In our HOA, we have a covenant. You can leave your garbage cans out and you're violating the covenant, but guess what? The covenant is still in effect. That's a covenant. It's more than a contract. It's more than a promise. And Jesus said this, remember, in Matthew 26, he takes takes the bread and he says, take, eat, this is my body. But then he says this in verse 28, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Our God made a blood covenant with us through our bridegroom. A covenant that we would be his people. So Sunday, we were able to take that bread. We were able to remember that body that hung on the cross for us. We took of the fruit of the vine and we remembered the covenant that was instituted by his blood. We glory in the fact that we were able to be, invited to be a part of the bridegroom. And so I want you to listen to some old vows. Because here's what I believe that Jesus would say to us today. I, Jesus, take you, heart and valley, to be my wedded wife to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and cherish, even death will not part us. And then we ask Sunday, and I ask you today, this is a we do, an I do, if you're watching at home. Just listen to the old vow. And give an answer if you feel led. Do you, Hardin Valley, do you, child of God, do you, Christian, betrothed to Jesus, take Jesus to be your husband, promising before God and everyone here that you will be a faithful, loving, and devoted bride, forsaking all others and keeping yourself for Him alone? What would you say to that? And then repeat with me the following. 
we the Hardin Valley Church take Jesus to be our wedded husband. Are you saying it out loud with me? Because there's something to be said for actually speaking it. You're standing in front of your bridegroom, right in front of him. And you're making these vows to him. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better or worse, Jesus, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, I'll do this. To love and to cherish, even death will not part us. That's a lesson for today. And we ended with the most appropriate song that I could think of, really. Because I think all of this is contingent on our willingness to submit. That's what Paul says. First and foremost, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then, husbands do this, wives do this. And understand that I'm not just talking about husbands and wives. I'm talking about Christ in the church. It's going to be some hard work. And we sang, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Hmm. Is that true with you today? I pray it is. I pray that, man, your relationship with your bridegroom is one that not only blesses you, but blesses others. Let's close in a prayer. God, thank you so much for the time we've been able to spend together. I pray you use the word in our lives. Help us not just to be hearers, but to be doers, and it be all to your glory. Thank you so much for loving us enough to invite us into this relationship of being your bride. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day.